Greetings. I hope you're having a great day. Life around here continues to run at a pretty hectic pace lately, and the new puppy only adds to that chaos. In fact, that's why I'm up here filming in the kitchen today, because I just can't trust her on her own yet. She just gets into way too much trouble. I hope you noticed I also did a new intro for my videos. And you can let me know what you think of that down below in the comments, if you think it's a good intro or not. Do you ever wonder if your interpretation of a biblical passage is correct or not? Ever wonder this when you're preparing to teach a class, a Bible study, or preaching a sermon on a passage? And especially if you're taking a class from me, I love getting my little red pen out and letting it bleed all over the place. When we had a campus for Fuller Seminary here in Colorado Springs, so many of my students have moved into leadership positions in churches around this area, I used to joke that in 100 years, scholars are going to be researching the Parisian heresy in this area that I started. Now, in relationship to this whole idea of finding the correct meaning of a passage, I want to take a slightly different tack to this question that you normally hear about in this video. All too often when we talk about the correct interpretation, we're working off two presuppositions. The first is that the meaning of the Bible is fixed and pretty clear to get at. And the second is, is that by using the right methods and tools, we will arrive at the precise meaning of the text. I don't want to downplay learning the correct methods and tools for interpreting the Bible because I've spent most of my adult life teaching people in seminaries and other institutions how to do that very thing. So that would be pretty self-defeating on my part. And the idea that the Bible means just one thing and that this message is perfectly clear, well, if that were true, then we would not need seminaries, universities, books, study Bibles, and other biblical software to get at its meaning. Nor would we have 2,000 years of interpreters working on questioning and debating just what the text means. Now, not all passages are tricky to get at, but some are. Interpretation is very, very complex, but that's not why I want to look at today. What I want to consider today is once you've dug into a passage and have arrived at what you think it might be teaching, how can you have some confidence or certainty in your conclusions? I can't tell you the number of times I've changed my view on a particular text, especially as I go back over and look at how I used to teach that particular passage a number of years later. I often think as I'm preparing the class, hmm, that's a great example of how not to interpret this passage. And when you start looking at how different interpreters understand the text today, and that isn't even considering how the text was interpreted in the past, you see that there's just a wide variety of opinions. Now this question is even more important if you're a teacher, pastor, or clergy, because then it's not just your interpretation, but you are influencing others to read the passage in this way. So let me share with you three guidelines that will hopefully help you know if your interpretation is appropriate or not. The anti-guideline. Don't think that you're going to arrive at the perfect understanding of a text or even 99% positive about what that interpretation is. As a church, We've been at this thing for over 2,000 years and haven't arrived at definitive interpretations and understandings yet. So cut yourself some slack. You're not going to be the one who's going to put the icing on the cake in regard to a particular passage. Does this mean then that we give up and say that it means whatever we want it to? No, and I'll get to that in a minute. Rather, let's take a look at this from a mathematical perspective. Math has this great term called asymptotic. Here's a helpful definition of this term from Wolfram Mathworld. Informally, the term asymptotic means approaching a value or curve arbitrarily closely, i.e. as some sort of limit is taken. A line or curve A that is asymptotic to a given curve C is called the asymptotic of C. I told you that was going to be helpful. What it means is that a line or a curve can get very, very close to each other at some point, but it will never get there. In physics, there's the speed of light. This is an absolute. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. 
Now, we keep making things go faster and faster and faster, and we get closer and closer to the speed of light, but we will never get there. It's an absolute value. We are having an asymptotic relationship between what we are able to do and the absolute value of the speed of light. Think of meaning sort of along those lines. When the end times arrives and all history is wrapped up and we're sitting around in heaven trying to think up what we're going to do for the next 10,000 years, well, here's your chance to get up and go over to Ezekiel or Paul and ask them what the heck they meant by that passage when they wrote it. That's sort of like the speed of light for us. We are trying to get closer and closer to that meaning. And sometimes we take two steps forward only to fall back three steps. But we are constantly trying to arrive at that asymptotic goal. Oftentimes when someone asks me what the text means, I go into some form of deferment. What do you think it means? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Oh wait, I just got a phone call. I gotta take this, back in a minute. Hey, 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 it's okay, come here. Yeah. Here's the enigma of reading the text. A text consists of little black marks on a page. On its own, it's meaningless. It just sits there. Every student of mine who has ever taken Greek knows this experience all too well. With great excitement, they buy their Greek New Testament text. They then come to class, rip it open, only to stare at the page filled with little squiggles and dots that they have no idea at all what it means. They need to learn what each mark means, how they fit together, how those marks compile to make words, words codas, then paragraphs, and finally an entire text. The same thing in English. In the process, we bring all those little black marks back to life. A text is a form of communication between a sender and a reader. Once the author lets go of that letter or the book, it drifts out of their hands to the reader. Sometimes this involves some form of postal or delivery service. With the biblical text, we need to remember that it has drifted far and wide to reach us. Consider a letter like Paul's to Philemon. Paul writes it, hands it to Onesimus and a few other disciples. This letter is then carried by them from Paul in Rome to Philemon in Asia Minor. It then got copied by others, incorporated into early collections of the New Testament text. It was translated into Latin, into German, and finally into English. It has drifted across a vast geographical distance, languages, and 2,000 years of history. This means that it's critical that we learn how to read it as best as possible. And this is why I've taught at seminary, to prepare the next generation to read and pass those texts on in a faithful manner, to bring the little black marks on that page back to life. Let me, if you will, use another analogy, this time for music. Consider a musical score. It has little black marks on a page that we must learn how to read, understand, and then what it corresponds to on the instrument. So let's consider a musical score that has some history to it, like one of Bach's pieces. When Bach lived 500 years ago, the world was quite different than it is today. Not as drastic as the time in the New Testament, but far enough that most of us would have had a very difficult time living even then. And they didn't have coffee then, not in Europe. The musical instruments that he wrote his music for were vastly different than those today. They had harpsichords, not pianos like we do today. So here's the question. Should we play his music using instruments that were available during his day? Or can we use modern instruments? Which is more correct? Which is more faithful to what Bach intended? And that isn't even taking into consideration a performance like Switched On Bach or a jazz rendition of one of his works. All these different performances will sound different, but they also share similar broad strokes. The progression of notes will be similar, as well as the chord patterns. And once we have learned how to play an instrument and we're familiar with Bach's works, we would be able to say, wow, now that was a truly amazing rendition of his work. Or, 
I don't know where these people got the idea that they were playing box work. This was just a pure exercise in the figment of their imagination. And what about the people who have no musical training at all and say that they're going to be able to perform this fugue by Bach? I doubt that you'd be able to stand more than a few minutes of their cacophony. Like music, we need to learn how to perform the text. And when we perform the text, we draw upon our training. We draw upon how the text has been performed by others who have come before us or that we've sat under and listened to their teaching. In other words, we draw upon our education and our place in a community that has been performing, interpreting these texts for the past 2,000 years to give us guidance if we are on the right track or not. So we have an asymptotic goal of our interpretation. We've been trained in how to interpret the text and are part of a tradition that has been doing this for 2,000 years. Now we need to consider the fruit of our interpretation. Criteria number three, love. Love introduces what is termed a hermeneutic of consequences. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul redefines and explains what love is, agape. And he puts it in the context of our asymptotic goal, the end of time. In verse 8, he writes that love never fails or falls. It never comes to an end. Love does not belong to this age, but it reigns in the eternal order as well. By contrast, the spiritual gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge will all come to an end and disappear from the scene. Now, knowledge is the one that I have the toughest time with. I spent way too much of my time in schools getting degrees, and my students spent a lot of time and money learning under me. But all this will get vaporized as we pass from this age into the next. But not so with love. In fact, Paul writes in verses 8 through 10 that we know only in part now, but in the next age we will know completely or perfectly. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul arrives at his conclusion, and he discusses the triad of faith, hope, and love. Now, these three virtues were a common triad in early Christianity. You can see this in Romans 5, Ephesians 4, and Galatians 5. But this is perhaps the most clear statement of them. In the age to come, faith will give way to open vision. Hope is going to be swallowed up by realization. But love will remain unchanged, even in perfection in the age to come. Karl Barth wrote about this. He said, because the sun is rising, therefore all lights go out. Now there's a two-sided temporal nature to love. It is both before and after the end of times. E.P. Sanders put it this way. Put in less traditionally religious terms, agape is the presence of the transcendent in the sphere of the finite. Love becomes an excellent criteria to test our application and understanding of a text by, since the experience of love is on both sides of the eschaton. This idea that I'm giving you here is not something new. It was argued by Augustine 1,600 years ago. Whoever thinks that he understands the Holy Scriptures but interprets them in a way that does not tend to build up the twofold love of God and our neighbor that person does not yet understand the Bible as he ought. If, on the other hand, someone draws a meaning from them that may be used for the building up of love, even though it does not disclose the precise meaning of the text that the author intended to express, his error is not pernicious, or he is not lying or in error regarding this. Now I hope that these three criteria give you the following. One, some comfort in knowing that you don't have to have a perfect interpretation of the text. In fact, you won't have it. Number two, at the same time, lay down a challenge to keep pressing forward towards the final goal of interpretation when we pass over into the next age. Third, we do this to the best of our ability and active participation in a 2,000 year old community of interpretation. And finally, we can measure our interpretation by the virtue of love, as Augustine wrote. Until the next video, I will leave you with the word of peace.